you all. All right, go ahead and be seated, you guys. Have a seat. I love you, Saddleback Church. Love you all. It's a little like having your funeral without dying. It's a little bit what it's like. I, uh, the truth, it is true that I would have uh, rather really not done this, just sort of wandered off, you know, a little bit more quietly. But I also think it's a good thing to recognize the past and to celebrate each other. And uh, I'm really grateful for, uh, for the love I just felt from you guys. When they asked me uh, about doing a weekend like this, I told them, you know, the main thing I want to do is just have an opportunity to share from my heart some things that God has said to us about his promises and about his love. And that's what we're going to do together in a few minutes. Let's take some time to do that. But first, since I have you all together, and so I won't have to answer this a thousand times, I, I'd like to take a moment to talk about what Shondell and I are doing next. You've probably seen that uh, both Rick and I, we, it's, what, what do we call this thing that we're doing? I, I know technically it's called retirement, but I'd sort of like to redefine that word because for a lot of people, you hear the word retire and you think, oh, you're doing crossword puzzles now, you're doing lawn bowling, that's, that's your whole thing. I'd like to help redefine the word because it is about just doing something different, still using God's gifts and doing it in a different way, but also about supporting other people and using God's gifts. Some of you are coming into that season and God still has a lot of life for you to live, a lot of things for, for you to do. But it is true that we are retiring. We've used other words like not retire, but refire. But that sounds a little intense, so I don't know. It just sounds a little bit, or redeploying or renewing or repurposing. And I, I like some of those words, but I, I guess if I had to say what we're doing is we're stepping down. We're stepping down from something I love to do, still have energy to do, but it's time. It's time to let a new team come in. It's time to let some new leadership come in. And understanding the timing of that in your life and my life is one of the things about following him in the, in the right way. We're stepping down, but we're not stepping out. Shondell and I, we're still going to live in the area. We're not moving. Salabak's still going to be our church. We're still going to be around. You'll still see us on the weekends. I'll be volunteering to do some of what I used to be paid to do. So I'm joining a bunch of you guys as volunteers. I get to be a volunteer together with you. Uh, I wouldn't see myself speaking many weekends because we have a new wonderful teaching team that's coming in that I am really looking forward to being inspired by each weekend. In fact, let me just stop a minute and say I am just thrilled that Andy Wood is gonna be our next senior pastor at Saddleback. I am really looking forward to his leadership. I see a bright, bright, bright future with his leadership for Saddleback. And alongside of that, Stacy Wood, his wife, she's gonna be teaching from time to time, and you guys are gonna be so inspired by her teaching. I am really thrilled and, and looking forward to that. We're still gonna be in the area. We'll still be in the church. I'm still going to be teaching drive time devotions and some small group Bible studies, and I'll still be helping purpose driven churches all over the world. I, I know that I'm still going to be here on the weekend. I'll still be thrilled to talk to you guys out on the patio and pray for you. I may not be here all four services every weekend, if that's okay with you. So if this sounds a little bit like goodbye and we'll see you next week, it is a little like that, but it is a good thing to take a moment just to recognize some wonderful things God's done the last 31 years and also to look forward to what he's gonna do next. I know some of you, like this is your first weekend here and you're thinking, what did I run into? It's sort of a, a family weekend in some ways, but I want you to know this is a family for you. What Saddleback Church is all about is welcoming everybody into the family. So if it's your first weekend, I hope you will feel welcome. We want you to be a part of this family. We're enjoying what God's going to do in the future, and we want you, we want you very much to be a part of it. So I have a few things on my heart I'd like to share with you. And I found a verse that sort of summed it up very simply. It's in your program. There's an outline that goes along with the message. You might pull that out. And you see the first verse there is 1 Corinthians 1.4, which says... I always thank my God for you and for the gracious gifts that he's given to you now that you belong to Christ Jesus. So that's, that's what I'd like to take a few moments to do, just to thank God for you. I am so thankful for you. And then also to talk together about the gracious gifts that he's given to us. There are so many. I want to look at just three of them. 
and the meaningfulness, the significance of the kinds of gifts that God gives to us. But I wanted to start by, we wanted to start by saying thanks. So I asked Shondell, my wife, to join us for this first part. We just want to share some thanks with you at the beginning of this. Hello, beautiful. <laughs> you know, I don't know why it is as you get older, you look at the guys and you think, he should have retired 10 years ago. That's how he looks. And you look at the women and like, they're more beautiful every year. Is this true? I don't understand this. <laughs> Life isn't fair. Just do your <laughs> so we thank God for you. Let us, let us just share a few ways. First of all, thank you, Saddleback Church, for trusting an unproven young pastor from a small church in a small town who also happened to be Pastor Rick's brother-in-law for trusting, for trusting us to come and be part of the pastoral team at Saddleback Church so many years ago. We will forever be grateful to you. Thank you. Thank you for what you've done in the lives of our children. You have loved them and believed in them and poured into them, and that has shaped their faith and their love for Jesus. You know, I'm not even just talking about all the SK and JHM and HSM and college ministry leaders. There were a lot of those that uh, poured into the lives of our three kids, but all of you. All of you on the patio, just saying an encouraging word or, well, you look really cute today. So the boys didn't really like that. But, <laughs> you know, just being encouraging and yeah. being, yeah. giving them attention even. And it has made a difference. And thank you for your love for God's word. Mm -hmm. For the kind of yes. love for God's word that yes. you show by doing what it says. And even when you struggle, you get back to showing it by doing what it says. We're thankful for you. Thank you for your honesty about your hurts, habits, and hang-ups. I think about the hundreds of people that have come across this stage and shared very difficult, sometimes horrific, things that had been done to them or that they had done, and openly gave glory to God for the change in their lives. And that has been amazing. And, and we have, for those of you who haven't been on this stage, but have shared with us out on the patio, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of you about what God has done to transform your lives in the midst of hurts, habits, and hang-ups. Thank you for your vision. You know, a lot of people talk about Pastor Rick's vision, and he is a visionary leader. But he, any leader would know that his vision without your vision means nothing. And you are a church with vision. You have the vision to see that God put you on this planet to make a difference. And to believe that he wants to make a difference through your life in his church, letting people know the good news of Christ's love. I'm so grateful that you are a people of wonderful, powerful vision. Thank you for your generosity. Your faith has stretched our faith. As, as um, Pastor Rick would, oh, that really sounds weird <laughs> to call him Pastor Rick. <laughs> as Rick would give a new challenge to us every three years or so, it seemed like there for a while, um, to grow in our faith and grow in our giving, I would kind of roll my eyes and go, oh boy, here we go again, you know, and because I'm the family bookkeeper, so I, I know, you know, what's, we're, you know, but your example of your sacrifices and of you being willing to take, to let God take you in your finances to places that you didn't think you could go and sacrifices you didn't think you could make, but you did, and that inspired us and made us want to give more, yeah. And, yeah. We, and then we've been blessed because of it. Yeah. Thank you for putting up with all our growing pains. I, uh, when I came, I had a lot to learn about being a communicator of God's truth, come from a smaller church to a bigger church. And if you think this is false humility, go listen to some of those first sermons. This is not <laughs> false. This is not false humility. I mean, you guys, I came from, we were in a small farming community, and a lot of the people came from the South. I grew up in California, but I picked up some of their Southern accent when I came. You know how embarrassing that is to a Californian to have a, sorry, Southern, Southerners, but you know how embarrassing that is? So I had a ton to learn. I had a lot to learn about 
loving people in the midst of their hurts. I had a lot to learn about trusting God no matter what the circumstance. And uh, the Bible says we got to put up with each other's faults and hurts sometimes, and you certainly did that, and I'm thankful for that. Thank you for your care for hurting people. We've seen that care displayed in the ministries that you've started, in the way you have stepped up for things like grocery distributions and the different ways we have ministered together to our community. And then thousands upon thousands of you have made the choice to go around the world to share Jesus' love when you were terrified and thought you would never in a million years do that, but you said yes to God. And thank you for, thank you for the opportunity to worship with you. Uh, I've told you many times how nothing tears my heart up like listening to you sing. And I'm so grateful to be able to worship our God and Father together. Grateful for you. Thank you for the wonderful opportunity to experience the diversity that is in the body of Christ. Like Tom said, we grew up in a small town and really both of the churches that we went to, everybody kind of looked and acted and talked like us, you know, and it was, it was boring. <laughs> And at Saddleback, we have been able to meet all of you with so many different backgrounds and so many even, even heritage from different countries and even different faiths that you have come into the true faith from. And it's been wonderful as you have helped us, you have enriched us, and you've strengthened us in countless ways by teaching us that how much God loves diversity and how we don't want to all be the same. Finally, thank you for your thankfulness. You are a thankful church. You give thanks for one another. You express your thanks to your leaders, to us. This isn't just a one-time thing. We hear this week after week after week, year after year after year. Your thankfulness is one of the things I'm most thankful for about you. So Shondell and I together want to say thank we you. are thankful for thank you, you, Saddleback so Church. We love you so much. <laughs> I always thank my God for you and, and for the gracious gifts that he's given you. I want to just talk for a few minutes about just three of those gracious gifts. One from the Father and one from the Son and one from the Holy Spirit. It's a big weekend, so I'll pull out the Trinity. I mean, why not? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Really what this is about for me is this. If I had just three encouragements to give you, just three, it would be these three based on these three gifts. So from the bottom of my heart, I want to say to you, number one, accept the love of the Father. Accept the powerful, incredible love of the Father. There is nothing that will change your daily life so radically as accepting, really, truly, deeply, completely accepting the depth of God's love for you. Most famous verse in the Bible is about how God loves us. Some of you know it. John 3.16 says, For God loved the world so much that he gave his one and only Son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. Would you circle those words, so much? Our lives can be completely changed when we discover how much that so much really is. God completely, totally loves you. It's hard for us to picture. The Bible is filled with words about it to help us to get a sense of how much that so much really is. Ephesians 3, 17 to 18 says, I pray that Christ will be more and more at home in your hearts as you trust in him. And may your roots go down deep into the soil of God's marvelous love. And may you have the power to understand as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, how deep his love really is. And that's my prayer for you, that, that you would understand how wide and how long and how wide and how deep his love really is for you. God loves you. He has made that abundantly clear. He made you. He created you. God didn't have to create you. God is God. He's totally satisfied in who he is. He didn't have to make us to be happy. He made us just to love us. And then when we walked away from him, when we sinned, 
Instead of walking away from us, he gave his life for us on a cross. Jesus stretched out his arms and he said, this is how much I love you. I'm willing to die for you so that we can continue to have a relationship. That's how much he loves you. And he tells us again and again that he wants us to be with him forever. God doesn't just put up with you. He wants you to be with him. He enjoys hanging out with you so much that he wants to do it forever. Completely accept God's love for you. I want to encourage you, make that your life goal. Make that your life goal, because I can't think of a more important goal. The more completely you accept God's love for you, the more completely you will be able to love God, and the more completely you're going to be able to love others. God loves you more than you can imagine. Nothing can separate you from his love. Look at these famous verses from Romans chapter 8. I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love, neither death nor life neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today nor our worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or on the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever, will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that's revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. So completely accept that love of God for you. And my question often as I read the Bible is, how? How, how do I do that? I mean, I, I see that this is something I should do. I can understand that it could be good for me. But how do I do that? And there's a secret. There's a single word that helps you to understand how to do that. And that is the word trust. Would you write that word in? The biggest question of your life, every day of your life, is this, whose opinion about you are you gonna trust? Are you gonna most trust your own opinion about yourself? You got some good days, you got some bad days. Are you gonna trust other people's opinion of you and base your feelings about yourself on that? Or are you gonna trust God's opinion of you and what he says about you? The Bible says in 1 John 4, 16, we know how much God loves us. And we have, and here's the moment when things change, we have put our trust in his love. God is love, and all who live in love live in God, and God lives in them. So there's this moment when you say, instead of putting my trust in how I feel about myself today, God, I put my trust in the fact that you love me no matter what. Instead of putting my trust in what they said about me yesterday, God, I put my trust in the fact that you love me no matter what. God knows you better than you know yourself. He knows all your strengths. He knows all your weaknesses, and still, he completely loves you completely loves you. You know, because it sort of fits here, I thought one of the things I wanted to share this weekend, you might all enjoy hearing, my favorite dumb thing that I ever said in a message over the years. I mean, that's always a good thing to hear, right? So here's my favorite dumb thing, and it had to do, it was a midweek service, and I was having people do some fill-ins, and I based it on some old King James language. In the book of Isaiah, it talks about how our life on this earth doesn't last. And it says we're all like grass, like the grass of the field that's gone here today, gone tomorrow. We're all, we're all but dust, it says, which means we're all from the dust of the ground. We're not going to last. So I, I had people filling this in. But I was thinking, King James, uh, Saddleback, we don't think that way. A lot of you, you became believers or later in life. That's, that's not the phrases you think in. So when I said it, it sounded different to them than I was trying to say it. I said, fill this in with me. We're all like grass. Okay, like grass. We're all but dust. We're all but dust? I mean, they're trying to figure that in. It didn't sound right as they're filling it in. And this woman in the back, she starts tittering, like laughing, and then everybody else got it. And there's this roar that's coming forward, like, oh, but dust, oh, but dust. And I'm standing up here going, I don't know what they're laughing about. I don't know what's going on. Tell somebody in the front row funny, hey, but dust, that's what he's talking about. And the truth is, when you look at your life this last week, we are all but dust sometimes. I mean, <laughs> That's, that's the truth of our lives. We look at our lives and we think, man, I messed that one up. How come I couldn't get that one right? And things don't last that long and things are falling apart and don't come together. We all feel like butt dust sometimes. Let's just admit that, all right? And God says, I know you feel that way, but still, I completely, absolutely love you more than you can possibly imagine. God knows how short our life is on this earth. 
God knows how fragile we are. God knows how we want to make commitments that don't make those commitments, and still he completely loves us. God knows every great intention you've ever had that you never got done, and he still completely loves you. God knows every hidden hypocrisy that you want no one else to know. You don't even want to admit it to yourself, and still he completely loves you. And it's not that he knows the bad and still completely loves us. He sees a good in us that is above and beyond what we can imagine. He has put the love of Christ on us. So when he looks at you, he actually sees his son. He looks at you and he sees the forgiveness that was poured out on you on the cross. So when God looks at you, he doesn't shake his head and go, well, I love him anyway. He looks at you and says, forgiven. There they are, forgiven, I love them. When he looks at you, he sees his son. He sees the perfection that's in Jesus. He doesn't look at you and say, oh, there's that mess up again, but I still love him. He looks at you and says, the perfection of my son, I put it on them. He sees the glory of what God's going to do in all of eternity in you. So God rejoices in you every time he looks at you because of what you've been given in Christ. He completely loves you. So I, I encourage you, completely accept the love that our God has for you, that our Father has for you. Just, let's just pause a minute, not rush by this. Just take a moment and breathe that in right now. God, I completely accept the depth of your love for me. And now, based on that love, here's a second encouragement I'd like to give you. Number two, follow the way of Jesus. First, if I had three things to say to you, first I'd say completely accept the love of God for you, the Father, and second, follow the way of Jesus. If you're a student of history, you know that for 2,000 years, the world around us has tried to confuse and complicate what it means to be a Christian. They try to make it about sociology or, or, or psychology or about community development or about history or political science, when the truth of the matter is it's about following a person. It's about following the way of Jesus. Now, because faith impacts every area of our lives, of course it impacts those areas. But when you get right down to it, it's all about following the way of Jesus. Your faith is not something that you study. It's living the way that Jesus lived. Your faith is not something to discuss. It's acting the way that Jesus acted. Your faith is not something to argue about. It's loving the way that Jesus loved. One of the early names for Christianity, in fact, even before we were called Christians, that didn't come for a little while, was just the way. The first followers of Jesus said, I'm a follower of the way. Look at this next verse in your outline. When Paul was talking about his life in Christ, he described it to somebody this way in Acts 24. I admit that I worship the God of our ancestors as a follower of the way. And what I want to suggest for you, for me, for all of us, is that would be something good to get back to again and again and again. I'm a follower of the way of Jesus. In fact, I brought a copy of my first Bible. This is my first Bible as a new follower of Christ in the 1970s. This isn't the exact copy because it was destroyed in a flood, but it looked just like this. My first Bible was one that said, down here, the living Bible, but up here it says, it's the way. That's what we're doing, is we're following the way of Jesus. And I'm saying, this is something to get back to. This is a paperback Bible, but the way of Jesus is what it's all about. I, I can still remember, after this, my second Bible was this cool, faux leather, green, padded living Bible. I mean, some of you remember this. Didn't you feel cool when you got that one? Because you could also use it as a pillow at summer camp. I mean, it was the most awesome Bible ever. So, this simple paperback Bible, Guys, we got to get back to this. This is what it's all about. The simplicity of, I'm following Jesus. His way is my way. That's the way I want to go in life because he showed me the way. He is the way, the truth, and the life. I'm following the way. So what does it mean to follow the way of Jesus? Well, that's like the whole Bible. That's what the whole Bible, how do you follow the way of Jesus in the way you talk? How do you follow the way of Jesus in the way you treat your kids? How do you follow the way of Jesus in the way that you uh, are a husband or a wife? How do you follow the way of Jesus in your work? How do you follow the way of Jesus in your character, in your hope, in your dreams? How do you follow the way of Jesus? 
So instead of trying to explain the whole Bible to you right now, I'd just like to touch on a couple things. Following the way of Jesus, it's the greatest blessing you're ever going to receive, and it's the greatest commitment that you're ever going to make. And I want to look at two things Jesus said about it. Two times he talked about what it meant to follow him. First, he tells us, follow in my way, it's the greatest blessing that you're ever going to receive. Jesus said to the people in John 8, 12, I'm the light of the world. So if you follow me, you won't be stumbling through the darkness, for living light will flood your path. We all know how frustrating it is to stumble around in the darkness. To follow Jesus means that light floods your path. He gives you the light that you need for the next step, for his direction, for your work, for your relationships, for your decisions, for your goals, for your hopes, for your dreams. He shows you the way to go. For me personally, over the years, when things would get confusing, when life wasn't working out as I thought it should work out, I've been a pastor for 40 plus years now, and there's been plenty of those times, this is what would get me through. I'd remind myself, let's just get back to basics. Jesus, I'm just following you. And I might be confused today, but I can still follow you. You can still show me somebody to love. You're going to still show me a place I can hope. You can still show me a way I can trust in you today. Getting back to the basics of I'm just following the one who loves me the most, that, that is what I dream of for all of us. It's the greatest blessing in life. It's also the greatest commitment that you'll ever make. And we are made to make great commitments. God made us to make great commitments, not to, not to fool around on the edges of life, but to live in the center of the greatest commitments of life. And Jesus said it this way in Luke 9, 23. He said to the crowd, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must turn from your selfish ways, take up your cross daily, and follow me. Now those, when you read them, he's talking about a great commitment. It's pretty obvious, but those also are pretty religious sounding words. It's hard for us to connect with them. So let me remind you that this is Jesus saying this. And just, just for a moment, pretend that you're sitting across the table from Jesus, and he's not preaching a sermon, he's not teaching a theology class, he's just talking to you personally about what it means to follow him. If you think about it that way, here's what he's saying. He's looking at you across the table, and, he, and, and he's saying, are, are you willing to let go of your selfishness? Are, are you willing to stop living life just for yourself, but to start living for other people? Start living for loving other people? Are you willing to turn from your selfish ways? I know, he says to you, it's going to be a struggle. Everyone struggles with selfishness. But there is a better way than the selfish way. And Jesus might look you in the eyes and say, aren't you tired of trying to prove yourself and protect yourself and promote yourself? You can turn away from that trap of it being all about you. Are you, are you willing to let go of your selfishness, he says. And then he says... Are you willing to take up my cross daily? And you think, whoa, that really sounds religious. What does that mean? Because Jesus, I mean, I think you died on a cross. That sounds pretty scary. What's he talking about? And Jesus would say, I, I'm not telling you you have to die on a cross every day. I'm talking about what the cross means. For Jesus, the cross meant doing the will of God. Not doing his will, but God's will. You might remember in the Garden of Gethsemane, the night before Jesus died, he's talking to God about the cross. And he says, nevertheless, Father, not my will, but your will be done. Jesus is saying, are you willing to live that kind of life? The not my will, but God's will be done? Because you know that God's will is greater. You know that God's will is better. You know that God's will is what you were made for. Jesus is saying, if you're willing to let go of your selfishness, if you're willing to hang on to living for God's will in your life, then he says, follow me, because that's where I'm going. That's where I'm going. And I'll take you into that the rest of your life. Come and follow me every day. Now, there are going to be days when you feel like doing that. There's going to be a lot of days when you don't feel like doing that. Like, God, could we have a selfish day today? I mean, I just need one selfish day. Of course, you take the selfish day, and at the end of the day, you're more depressed than you were at the beginning of the day. It never works, but we feel that way sometimes, right? I do. We all do. So how do you make it through every day? day following him. And the secret is, write this one in with me, the secret is relationship. 
You do it in relationship with him. You realize that it's about following a person, not a theology, not a principle. You're following a person. God, 1 Corinthians 1, 9 says, God who called you into fellowship, fellowship with his son Jesus Christ our Lord is faithful. Circle that word fellowship. It means relationship. We are in fellowship with each other in the body of Christ, but that's because we're in fellowship with him. We're following him. We're following a person. Following the way of Jesus means you stay close to him. And if you stay close to him, you're going to follow him. And you do what he's asking you to do today. Now, how do you stay close to him? Well, it's pretty simple. You talk to him and you let him talk to you. You communicate. You talk to him. That's prayer. You let him talk to you through his word, through his spirit. You listen to him and you follow him day after day. That, if I look back at the last 40 years of being a pastor, that is the habit that has gotten me through day after day. Is this habit of a few minutes of talking to God at the beginning of the day and a few minutes reading five or ten verses and letting him talk to me. Some days it feels like heaven came down. Most days it feels like just a natural conversation. But the communication just keeps on going. It's called a daily quiet time. And I want to encourage you. If you're not spending some time every day talking to God and letting him talk to you to start doing that. You don't have to do it like I did. Everybody's going to do it differently. We're made differently. It's a relationship. One of my great privileges at Saddleback, my first 10 years as the pastor of maturity, was teaching our class 201 how to develop spiritual habits. And one of the habits I got to teach thousands of you was this habit of spending daily time with God. If you haven't Establish that habit, get it started. If you got it started and you got away from it, get back to it. Because that's what it's all about, is this relationship with God. And I, I don't know the path that he has for you. That's why you get close to him. That's why you follow him. But I do know one thing in common for all of us on this path that he has. If you're going to be like Jesus, you're going to serve other people. Because he came to serve and he came to help us to serve other people. Look at what he said in Mark 10, 45. Even the Son of Man, that's one of Jesus' names for himself. The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others. And to give his life as a ransom for many. So the rest of your life, you're going to be with Jesus, following Jesus, having this opportunity, this privilege to serve. You know, some of my favorite people at Saddleback, our, our founding members, those people that were here from the very beginning, when we didn't have any buildings, we didn't even know where we we're going to meet every week, or when we first moved on this property, we just had an open air tent and like a moonscape, there wasn't any landscaping, but they just kept following Jesus through it all. And I went, I went to see one of our founding members a couple months ago. Uh, he was near death, and I knew that he was. I didn't know when I went to see him that it was just going to be a few days before he went to heaven. But I went into the hospital room to see Max, Max McDougal, and uh, just to talk to him. And Max always has had a lot of energy. He still had a lot of energy, even two days before he was going to go to heaven. So he's talking about this and talking about that. And he all of a sudden stops, and he looks at me and says, Tom, Tom, I got a question. I said, what? What is it, Max? And he said, can I still serve? Here he is in this, on his deathbed, and he's saying, can I still serve? Well, Max is my hero. That's the kind of heart that I want to have. Because Jesus served all the way to the end. Even in his death, he served us in the greatest way possible by paying for our sins. So I want to have that kind of heart where all the way through life, if I'm following the way of Jesus, I'm always asking, can I still serve? If God's leaving you on this planet, there's somebody for you to serve. And I told Max, of course you can still serve. There's somebody for you to pray for. There's somebody who needs encouragement. So who does God need you to serve today? That's part of following the way of Jesus. If you want to live the life that God made you to live, you, you accept, you completely accept the love of the Father. You follow the way of Jesus. And then you do a third thing. Rely on the power of the Spirit. Rely on the power of the Spirit. Let me tell you my greatest concern for myself, for you, for Saddleback Church as we look to the future. My greatest concern is that we would rely on our power rather than God's power. And it's an easy thing to do. When, when a church is small, when we don't know where we're going to meet each week, when we're meeting on a moonscape, it's easy to say, God, we need you to show up this week or we're not even going to have church. And you rely on God's power. 
But as the church grows and you get more campuses and you get buildings and you get more tools to work with, those are all blessings, but those blessings can become a curse if you start to lean on the things that God has given rather than the God who gave them. Listen, you and I as human beings, there's a lot we can do on our own power. I mean, just look at what people who don't know God get done every day. So there's a lot we can do just by the nature of the fact that we are created by God, but you cannot do eternal things on your own power. And we're about doing eternal things. God eternally changing people's destiny. God eternally changing people's character. That's what we're about. You can't do spiritual things on your own power. It takes God's spirit working with our spirit to create genuine change in us. And so many people are settling for the change that they can work in their lives and it just doesn't last or it ends up making them prideful or it rips up other things in their lives and they think, I just can't get a handle on this. You need genuine change. You need spiritual change. And only God's spirit can do that. And it happens more slowly than we want sometimes, but it also happens more certainly than we can imagine. He can genuinely change you from the inside out. I need, we need that kind of power. So I want to encourage you to embrace the truth that God wants to put a spiritual power into your life every day. You're not gonna feel powerful. This is not about us feeling powerful. We'll talk about that in more in just a moment. But you're gonna have his power in your life. The Bible says, Ephesians 3.16, I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. Let me tell you how much power this is that we're talking about. This isn't some small, little, tiny power. Next verse, Ephesians 1, 19 and 20, I pray that you'll understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe him. This is the same mighty power, the same mighty power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. We're talking about resurrection power. We're talking about the power that it takes to take someone who's been killed, crucified on a cross, and raise them from the dead for all eternity. That's the kind of power that God has put into your life and into my life. So how, how, how do you experience this kind of resurrection power? There is a secret to how this power gets to be at work in our lives. And it's not one that I love, I'll have to admit. I, I love the trust one, I love the relationship secret, but this one's a little bit harder for me. The secret to experiencing God's power is weakness. It's weakness. I have learned that as long as I feel strong, I tend to rely on my strength. I tend to settle for my strength, what I can get done. It's only when I recognize that I'm weak that I ask for God's strength. The Apostle Paul had an experience with this. He had a physical weakness in his life. And he had to talk to God about it and what it meant and why God would allow it because he was frustrated that he wasn't able to get some things done that he hoped he could get done and God had something to say to him about it. Look at 2 Corinthians 12, 9 and 10. But he, God said to me, my grace is sufficient for you for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, he says, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That, that is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in my weaknesses and in insults and hardships and persecutions and difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Now, this is one of those verses that tells me how much I still need to learn. The truth is, I, I think I can understand how God can use weaknesses. But to say with Paul, I delight in my weaknesses, I got some growing to do. I got some learning to do, but I want to do that growing because I know it is true that my strength pulls me away from God's strength and my weakness draws me toward God's strength. So you've got weaknesses in your life. What do you do with them? Well, I suggest you do what Paul did. He had a physical weakness, a physical ailment. He did two things about it. First, he asked God to take it away. You should do that. Say, God, I got this physical weakness. Would you want to heal it? Could you glorify yourself that way? Is that what you want to do? And you ask God and you keep asking God and trusting him for that. But at the same time, you also do the second thing Paul did. You boast in the weakness that you've been given. 
And I want you to notice very closely what he says. He says, I boasted in them so that Christ's power may rest on me. Listen, weaknesses do not automatically become a strength. Paul's telling us here that your weakness becomes a strength when you boast in that weakness. Now, the word boast here doesn't mean prideful, like, I got better weaknesses than you do. What it means is, what it means is to take joy in something, to recognize how God can work in the midst of something, how God is greater than something. God, this weakness, I hate it. I know you see how I feel about it, but I also know that you're greater than even this weakness, and you can work even in the midst of this. You find joy in that. So what I'm saying is, in this world that thinks that real power is only seen in human strength, God tells us that true power begins in weakness. Begins when we give our weaknesses to God and see his strength. And this is happening, this powerful work of God, it's happening in churches all over the world, every weekend, right now it's happening. It's happening through what we're doing right now. I mean, a, a guy or a woman stands up and talks for half an hour or so, maybe a little longer with some preachers, but about half an hour or so about God's word. And our lives get changed. People come to faith and say, I'm going to trust Jesus. I'm going to trust him for the kind of life that he wants to give. Or we see things differently than we saw them before. The Bible calls what I'm doing right now the foolishness of preaching. Because it's sort of foolish to think that somebody could talk for a little bit and life change could happen. How does that happen? By the power of God's Spirit. I, I can't tell you how many times Rick has heard somebody say, I've heard somebody say, Something like this. It was like just you and me were in the room. It, it was like you were reading my mail. It, it, it was like you knew exactly what I needed to hear. Well, that's not our power. That's God working in our weakness through simple words and the Holy Spirit showing up right where you are to say, this is for you. What we're talking about right now in this worship service, this is for you. And so you have that feeling of God is talking just to me because guess what? God is talking just to you. That is the power of God. Some of you, right now, you feel like you're about to go under because the truth is you feel like it all depends on you and it's all falling apart. And these verses are here to remind you, to remind us that it all depends, it all depends on the God upon whom it all depends. And you can lean on him even in your weakness. Some of you right now, you are tired in the journey. You're wondering if you've got what it takes. You are not seeing life work out like you expected, like you dreamed. Let me remind you of what God has to say to you about that. Isaiah chapter 40, he gives, God gives strength to the weary. And he increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord, those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. So let me encourage you. Instead of trying to be strong, admit your weakness and look to his strength. Now, Here's what I'd like to do as we close. I'd like to take a few minutes to pray a prayer commitment. There's a prayer commitment I'd like to pray, and I think some of you might like to join me in that prayer commitment. And then I want to welcome our worship team back and, and sing our commitment to God together. I love singing with you. And then after that, I'm going to come back. I have a few final words, a few final things to share, a final blessing from God's word to share with you. So we're going to pray commitment together. We're going to sing our commitment together, and then... I have a few final words for you. Let's start with that prayer of commitment. Would you pray with me? And honestly, personally, I can't think of a better time to refresh my commitment to what's most important. So I want to invite you right now to join me in that commitment. And just pray together. Father, I refresh my commitment today to completely accept your love. Just say that back to God. God, right now, I refresh my commitment to completely accept your love. Jesus, I refresh my commitment to daily follow your way. That's what it's all about, the simplicity of following you. I refresh my commitment to follow you, Jesus. 
and spirit, I refresh my commitment to depend on your power, even in my weakness, to depend on your power. And I pray this in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.